Hello and welcome back again. Still International Day of Peace, still the conference on online hate speech and how to curb it in order to create a more peaceful world society, humanity, so to speak. In this session, we will be looking at the UNESCO project Social Media for Peace. It's funded by the EU. It was launched early 2021, aiming to strengthen the resilience of conflict-affected uh, societies um, to potentially harmful online content through a two-legged strategy. It worked like this, on the one hand trying to better curb harmful content, at the same time promoting peace-building narratives on social media. Now, before I introduce our panelists to you, let's have a look at this short video so you get a very clear idea about what we'll be talking about. In our digital world, advances in technology have completely changed the way we access and share information. Social media has enabled us to shift from being passive receivers of information to becoming producers and editors of content, giving more people a voice and taking us closer to achieving more inclusive, just and peaceful societies, which lie at the heart of Sustainable Development Goal 16. But there are also growing concerns around the use of social media as an instrumental platform to spread harmful content, such as hate speech and disinformation. This has had significant impacts on conflict dynamics and peace. For instance, in 2018, Facebook recognized that the platform was being misused in Myanmar to fuel division and incite offline violence against the Rohingya people. More recently, following the riots at the US Capitol building in 2021, Twitter and other companies suspended Donald Trump's account, arguing there'd be a risk of further incitement to violence. While it's difficult to establish that online hate speech or disinformation directly causes or correlates to offline violence, there is growing evidence that some violence has been instigated online. Every second, more than 10,000 posts are shared on social media. To moderate this huge amount of content, platforms are using a mix of automated and human interventions and increasingly relying on artificial intelligence to detect hate speech and disinformation. But social media platforms admit they have limited capacity when it comes to training AI in minority languages or having trained human moderators who speak these languages. What this means is that content moderation cannot be applied universally and incitement to violence and disinformation can spread faster in developing and conflict-prone countries where there are already political tensions. Another issue is that we cannot bar every hateful word or piece of false information without taking local context into account. For example, in most countries, a dog is just a dog. But in some places, the word dog is used as a derogatory term to insult a specific group of people. If we rely on AI alone to take down content, a lot of legitimate and legal content will also be removed with a chilling impact on freedom of expression. To address these challenges, we urgently need to find global solutions that can be adapted to local contexts. This is the aim of UNESCO's new project, Social Media for Peace. Launched in early 2021 and funded by the European Union's instrument contributing to stability and peace, the project is being piloted in three countries, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Indonesia and Kenya. In each of these countries, UNESCO is investing in research to analyze how harmful content is circulating and consulting with communities that are most affected. We're also mapping how these issues are being addressed by local authorities and social media platforms through community guidelines and legal regulations. Bringing together multiple stakeholders, including tech companies, researchers, civil society organizations, media, and peace-building communities, 
The project will use the research findings to help define solutions that can effectively curb harmful online content at a local level. Lessons learned on the ground can help to drive stronger global solutions and promote the use of social media for peace in every country across the world. So there you are, all up to speed on this Social Media for Peace panel that we will be having right now. And let me introduce the panelists to you. Hubert is a director of UNESCO's regional office in Nairobi. Kenya is with us. Simon Boshan Muller, deputy head of unit uh, at the Foreign Policy Instrument of the European Commission. Iverna McGowan joins us, director of the Europe Office of Center for Democracy and Technology. Gerald Sowa is here, public policy manager of the content policy team of Facebook. Anita Wahid presides over the Indonesian anti-hoax movement Mafindo and joins us. And Maida Bato Kastendic is project coordinator of the Press Council in Bosnia-Herzegovina and also joins us for this conversation. <coughs> Excuse me. Welcome to all of you. Mr. Geisen, let me start by asking you social media for peace. Um, why is it of the essence right now in this time, uh, in this world of today, and specifically where you are in, in Kenya? Please tell us. as well um, and 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 uh, just to to say the question is always is is, is, is social media now in that sense a, a threat or is it an opportunity i would say it is it is both as usual the answer is it is both uh, yes social media can be a, a threat and and the, the, the video clip just now showed some of these examples but also an enormous opportunity if it is uh, used wisely and, and, and uh, responsibly. Um, social uh, media really have enhanced uh, significantly the, the, the free flow of ideas, expressions of opinions, uh, and the sharing of access uh, to information as well. Um, at the same time, we know that, that social media can also be misused. And uh, we have seen many examples uh, in the video just now. Um, I would also uh, refer to the, the COVID pandemic, uh, especially at the onset, uh, when there exists such an immense hunger for information uh, by everyone. Um, uh, and, and what we then also saw is an explosion of mis- and disinformation, uh, which at some stage, I would say, even spread faster than the virus itself. Um, uh, and also in times of elections, uh, we have seen emerging forms of, of algorithm driven campaigns, uh, fake news, information distortion, uh, polarization and hate speech, um, uh, and also other methods that, that undermine electoral democracy uh, in Africa, but also we have seen examples uh, in other parts of the world. Um, on the other hand, uh, yeah, and, and the previous panel discussed about regulation, um, to some call it also even censorship, um, uh, to censor social media postings. Uh, there are limitations to that, of course. Uh, it becomes a bit unclear where censorship uh, stops and, and dictatorship starts. Uh, there's a blurred line between that. In, in that regard, uh, there is a move in Kenya to, to criminalize a speech that is deemed offensive. That's the wording. Um, and that's under the National, National Cohesion and Integration Act. Uh, it is probably too vague and, and too broad, and it might be too restrictive for freedom of expression and to allow the free flow of information. I think what is more important is to, to educate uh, the social media users uh, and information uh, consumers, and as, as, as you said also before, the participants. Uh, the, uh, in social media, you become a participant. 
uh, media and, and news providers, uh, and, and in fact, uh, in social media, the participants, anyone uh, producing or sharing information, they, they have, of course, an ethical uh, responsibility to ensure that the information provided is, uh, is relevant, is, is useful, uh, and is truthful. Uh, but of course, uh, there is a real world out there, and, and we see that uh, there is a lot of mis and disinformation. Uh, and there is therefore uh, also a responsibility with the consumer of information. Uh, social media participants need to be critical in the, in the way they search for, in the way they uh, consume and share information, especially when using uh, social media. Um, so in Kenya, we have seen uh, the, the violence that followed the 2017 elections. Uh, and and uh, this has been a clear example of the, the dangerous impact of hate speech. Uh, and Kenya is heading now towards an election next year. Um, and it is therefore a good time to reflect on the role of the social media uh, in the lead up, uh, but also during uh, and also uh, in the immediate aftermath of uh, elections and, and to turn things uh, uh, around uh, and discuss how social media in fact can become a, a tool and a force uh, to fight mis and disinformation um, and to contribute to peace. Um, and, and that is what the the, as we call it, uh, SM for P uh, project uh, intends to do, the social media for peace. Over to you. Thank you very much for um, that, uh, Mr. Hayes, and that's uh, very, very clear. Um, speaking a bit more about the real world, we were in Kenya just now, let's move to Indonesia. Uh, Mrs. Wahid, um, you are heading one of the largest fact-checking networks in uh, Indonesia and I was wondering if you could give us an example of the impact and risks of harmful content on social harmony in Indonesia. How does it affect uh, living together there and how people see each other? Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, good afternoon everyone from Jakarta. Well, generally speaking, uh, when it comes to uh, harmful content online, such as disinformation and hate speech, they have always been part of the threats towards social harmony in Indonesia. All major conflicts that have happened in the past in Indonesia, be it religious conflicts, ethnic-based conflicts, or political conflicts, were preceded and accompanied by disinformation and hate speech. And uh, within the religious sphere, disinformation and hate speech have been used mainly to incite distrust towards different groups to the point of inciting intolerance and even, dis in, uh, even discriminative acts, particularly towards religious minority and religious marginal groups. And uh, as said, as we said before, within the democratic process, we also have the same problems of having disinformation, hate speech and malicious propaganda. Uh, have been widely used as weapons of political and ide uh, ideological contestation, not only to undermine the candidates and their supporters, but also to undermine and delegitimize the election process itself, which of course harms the electoral integrity. And if we take a look at the last eight years in Indonesia, the prevalence of disinformation, hate speech, and malicious propaganda in the last three major elections that we have here has propelled the society into religious political polarization, which impacted many public issue discourses, even well within uh, the, uh, the completion of the election itself, uh, including on the efforts to COVID-19, for instance. And we've seen that in between elections and conflicts, uh, disinformation and hate speech are heavily used to maintain hatred towards the other group in the polarization, where the societal context that persists is only you, us versus them, and, there's, and there, can, uh, there can never be any other context aside from that. And, and this will push people to political extremes, and, and the hatred then drove people to attack opponents and different opinions in social media and uh, hate speeches and also towards the other side and also harassment, bullying, mass lynching, doxing and even physical persecution. And in the case of Indonesia, it is apparent that the effects of disinformation and hate speech combined with the use of other comp uh, computational propaganda strategies uh, has been very, uh, very prevalent in, towards individual society and nations. 
individuals become irrational, uh, we become a nation of that lacks in critical thinking, we become very full of hatred, suspicion, and resentment, and we become very easily manipulated into political and or ide ideological agendas, for instance. And as a society, we become a, a hostile and violent one where uh, we can, all, can no longer tolerate differences. Um, Nationwide, uh, national disintegration is, of course, at stake. Uh, and the nation loses its capacity to trust, to be honest, to be respectful, to be understanding and fair to one another. Mm -hmm. And we also lose our capacity to find common ground and decide on common vision. And at the heart of it all, the nation loses its core principles of humanity, justice, equality, and unity. And I think uh, I'm very grateful for the projects such as Social Media for Peace because it is urgently needed to address these problems. Back to you. Thank you very much for that. It's um, a worry, some picture that you paint there, and I think it can be recognized by many across the globe in, in very um, similar situations. I just want to follow up on what you're saying. Um, how does um, fact-checking actually change something in that dynamic, or how does it help turn the tables and another question related to that, how do fact checkers, um, in your view, relate to journalists in that respect? Is there a difference? Are they the same kind of people doing the same kind of work or please? Well, fact checking is now getting more and more important uh, in the sphere of, of uh, uh, digital information ecosystem, especially uh, with the uh, increasing number of disinformation and hate speech, and particularly in this disinformation in this case. So uh, we are now trying to uh, add more and more people and create workshops uh, and educate people on how to tell the difference between uh, valid information and disinformation, for instance. And we conducted also educations uh, for public on, on how to use simple tools such that, that they won't be easily manipulated uh, by disinformation. And when it comes to journalists or media, uh, it may seem that we have similar work of fact checking and also the journalism works, but it's still different uh, um, in terms of uh, what we do is not to find out or chasing down uh, uh, sources, for instance, but we try to uh, see whether or not what what is in the information is valid or not. And, that, and from that, we decided to on on the label of this information or valid information. But we do believe that the work itself cannot be just uh, left out to only fact checkers or the journalists themselves. So it has to be a combined effort. And that's why uh, Mofindo with uh, 24 online media in, its, in Indonesia is, is collaborating in a checkfacta.com. These are, are uh, working um, collaboration on fact checking together. For some uh, cases, uh, fact checkers cannot work without the help of journalists and some other and in some kind of other cases, journalism cannot uh, work without the help of fact checkers. Mm -hmm. So it's a joint forces. And do you work with the social media platforms as well? Just very briefly, together. Do you collaborate? Uh, yes, do. yes. Okay. Yes, we do. We we work. Oh, sorry. We work as a third-party fact checker for one social media platform, also as trusted flagger for several others, uh, and so, uh, and some other uh, rules. Uh, working with the social media platforms. Okay, thank you very much because that was the bridging link I needed to get to uh, Mr. Soa uh, here on behalf of Facebook taking part in this discussion. Th discussion. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Soa. Um, when you're hearing all this, um, knowing what uh, lies at the heart, the ideals that lie at the heart of uh, Facebook, how do you look at this flip side of what happens on some social media and in the digital sphere? This, um, yeah, uh, on the one hand, promoting free expression, civic engagement, and then at the same time, it can morph into um, hate speech and disinformation. So thank you, first of all, for having me. It's a pleasure to speak with you all today and happy International Day of Peace. I think for us at Facebook, it's extremely important that our users feel safe and welcome when they use our products. Our key mission at the firm is to help people create connections and to help them build community, to build bridges, basically. So we're very cognizant of the fact that when people don't feel safe, they don't feel welcome, that they're less likely to engage in this way on our platform. Um, 
hearing from my, my colleague from Indonesia and from Nairobi, it's pretty clear that social media, um, though it's primarily and ultimately used as a force for good, and we've seen this particularly so through the pandemic where people have used our platforms to build community with their loved ones in spite of um, restrictions um, limiting the ability to do so in person. We've seen this throughout the inception of our various products where people have used our products for reconciliation. People have used our products to grow small and medium businesses. Our, our tools and products have really been a force for good for the most part, but then we do recognize that they can be harmful. And in, in recognition of this fact, we've developed community standards. Our community standards are the policies that outline what we allow and don't allow on Facebook and Instagram. These guide our automated review process and our human review processes in making decisions on the content that they see on the platform. To put things into perspective, there are billions of users who use each of our products on a daily basis, sharing billions of content. Um, and this content is shared in a variety of ways. I think if you move from my own home country of Ghana to Indonesia to um, Kenya or the UK, or Brussels, you would find that people engage with content in very different ways, and that poses a challenge. But it's a challenge that we're up to in ensuring that we're continuously investing in human review efforts and in our automation efforts to try and limit some of the risks that um, my colleagues here have spoken to today. Mm -hmm. um Two things I want to pick up on. You mentioned you want uh, people on the platforms to feel welcome and safe, understandably. But at the same time, um, the algorithms often seem to be uh, devised in such a way that um, what excites most, and let me use that in a neutral way, um, moves up faster, is being promoted more. Um, how, how do you balance those two um, realities then? Um, isn't the algorithm in fact also sometimes creating a not so safe environment that people then somehow are so excited about that they just go along with it in spite of what it might mean for themselves? So the algorithm really serves, it, it, it's really a personalized experience. You take all internet products from Netflix to Amazon to Google to Facebook what we're catering to is a personalized experience and the algorithm really does serve users with the information that they need you think about a small and medium business that's trying to connect to new customers our algorithms help them do that you think about users that are interested in picking up new skills our algorithms help them do that but then we do know that sometimes that people pursue interests that might not be um, positive in a self-serving way. And in those situations, we have provided resources to help combat that. So for instance, with suicide and self-injury, we wouldn't continuously expose individuals to content that could expose them to that kind of self-harm if they've shown an interest in that. And this is based on learnings that we've undertaken over the, 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 the years that we've been active as a company. Mm -hmm. um, our content moderation efforts are really a journey. As I set the scene earlier on, we operate at a very large scale. I don't think there's ever been a moment in history where any institution, or organization, or individual has had to engage with content at this sort of scale, where we're taking cultural perspectives into account, nuances in language for billions and billions of posts on a daily basis, trying to determine um, how best to protect their interests as far as safety is concerned. This is something that has never been done before. It's unprecedented. And we're continuously learning and growing yeah. and improving on our content moderation processes. Like you say, learning and, and um, finding out what works and what doesn't. In the previous session, the Myanmar case was mentioned where, uh, for lack of resources, understanding certain languages, etc., a lot of uh, hateful speech um, kept flourishing, so to speak, before uh, something was done about it. Um, what is needed, in fact, from Facebook's point of view to be able to better uh, manage content and, and to um, impact upon it in a way that is, according to you, to Facebook, acceptable? More people, more technological um, knowledge about AI. What, what is it you, you need? Where does the solution lie, according to you? So this is a process that will take time. Uh, it's a two-prong process. One, we need to ensure that we understand what's happening. And I think there's something that everybody here is acutely aware of, that 
in various communities, the way in which individuals engage with each other differs from one from one community to another. Even in our small family or friend groups, the way in which we engage with each other might differ from um, small social group to the other, right? So we need to continue engaging through platforms in opportunities like this and through other opportunities where we engage with civil society members, with researchers, with journalists and academics to understand how um, the various communities that use our products engage with the content that they see to understand how language is evolving, how culture is evolving, how the risks that we've identified are evolving. Understanding is a very key part of our content moderation efforts and a very key part of the way that we can grow. Um, from the people aspect, another thing that we can do is also continue to invest in our people and the talent that we hire. We've invested tremendously in Yukota and Myanmar, for instance, and this is an example of a place where we've in incredibly we incredibly increase the amount of um, human resource capacity that we've had so that we have people that not only understand the local language but also understand the cultural context through which content is shared on the um in the technology side we've continued to improve our automation review process so that we are proactively identifying content before most individuals see it um, to put things in context the billions of posts shared on a daily basis only a small minority of that is harmful but in the scale of billions a small minority is still a lot um, and if you look at our community standards enforcement report that we publish quarterly one of the things that you will notice is that we're continuously improving in the amount of content that we remove under hate speech so if you look back just three years ago and compare the data to what we have now we are proactively identifying hate speech eight times more um, than we did at the very beginning when that report was published. And this is a process that is continuing um, to improve. I think all these factors combined, investing in technology, investing in the talent that we hire, continuing to understand, will help us get better. But I think there would always be gaps. Context is something that we can't be perfect at. I think what's important is that we're committed to doing better and continue to understand that there will always be opportunities where in the scope of a billions uh, uh, billions and billions of posts there will be situations where there's one specific piece of posts where no amount of local or cultural context will provide insight on because this is language that is specific to a specific friend group and might be harmful in that context mm -hmm. but we do stay committed to doing better Okay, thank you for that. Stay with us. Um, I'll get back to you. Um, I want to move to Bosnia-Herzegovina and uh, address uh, Mrs. Kestanjic. Welcome to you too. Um, based on the situation in Bosnia-Herzegovina, would you say that online hate reflects what's going on in the offline real world? Or is it vice versa? Is online hate speech a reflection of what's already there? in real life. First of all, I would like to greet all of you. It is my big pleasure representing Bosnia and Herzegovina today on this special occasion. So um, taking consideration of Bosnia and Herzegovina recent events, uh, it's quite difficult to draw exact line between uh, those two events. So uh, hate speech in Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, being a long time issue and uh, it is being present both offline and online. So uh, as internet becoming um, an inseparable part of uh, our everyday communication, so as the social media, uh, the problem of hate speech uh, is becoming more complicated. So um, in the here, uh, hate speech is uh, often a characteristic of communication between our uh, politicians, our public uh, figures uh, who are uh, relativizing uh, those um, unlawful speech and they are sending a certain message uh, to citizens that uh, such way of communication uh, is uh, allowed and more uh, it is a desirable form of communication so uh, politi our politicians are uh, almost on daily basis using a hate speech as a way of uh, communication uh, also uh, in the past uh, time uh, especially they have been using a genocide a denial uh, which has been uh, criminalized uh, since July 2021 so we uh, we got amended our criminal code which prohibits genocide denial which is uh, uh, which shaped our uh, local events strongly 
uh, and also uh, our politicians uh, are uh, all the time uh, evoking certain events from the uh, recent past uh, as uh, they means uh, of getting political points because uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, is having uh, elections every two years. So uh, all the time we are in between of elections. So uh, pre-election campaign uh, isn't stopping all the time. So, And uh, one of the interesting things uh, which I have uh, seen uh, working on complaints of citizens and watching uh, content uh, of user generated um, contents of user generated contents yeah, uh, on internet portals is that uh, here a lot of uh, paroles which have been used by our uh, sports fan groups uh, which are still reflecting our past are being uh, transferred to our online sphere so they have been used also uh, by uh, people who are spreading hate speech in comments so uh, those are the same paroles which we can see at the football uh, stadiums uh, also uh, seen in our comments so it seems that those groups are posting uh, that kind of comments so they, they have been uh, copying that content uh, and also uh, offline uh, hate speech which has been produced by our officials our public person or uh, all other uh, different groups, certain uh, politician or uh, different interest group uh, is has also been uh, transmitted all the time to um, online sphere, mostly uh, on uh, comments section, but also on social media. Uh, and uh, that has been some kind of trigger for uh, communication uh, online. Uh, also, it is very uh, taking uh, into account all uh, local contents um, war that had happened um, in recent past. Uh, we need to be aware that there is a thin line uh, between offline and online sphere. And mm -hmm. uh, we need to take all measures that we have um, at, in our disposal uh, to uh, prevent uh, offline or <laughs> online uh, violence to uh, spill over in the real-time world because um, contents that we have uh, received as a complaint uh, they are showing that situation is being uh, really dramatic and it takes a lot of uh, patience uh, a lot of efforts from all of us uh, we from the press council uh, we are doing a lot of different things uh, to raise awareness on all dangerous uh, of uh, hate speech in online sphere, but still uh, we need more support, especially from all the other actors. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's very important to have in mind that Bosnia and Herzegovina is post-conflict country. Uh, and also, um, besides uh, evoking a recent past in, in negative uh, way, uh, unfortunately, those events are also uh, being a part of our regular uh, journalistic uh, media reportings, which are in line with our press code and all uh, journalistic standards. So, um, but um, unfortunately, we have received uh, inquiries from uh, media, from editors in chief, that uh, that kind of content has been flagged uh, as a contact uh, which is not in line with social media platforms' terms of use. Uh, but that is our reality and media should report about those events because they are still strongly reflecting our our everyday situation. Yeah. Uh, so that would be in short uh, yes, it's situation a, in online and offline in Bosnia. It's a very clear answer and, and it uh, describes a potentially very inflammatory situation. Um, I think uh, everybody gets that. Um, just before we um, talk about what so the social media for uh, peace project might change in that regard, might help to overcome the difficulties of this situation, one more question for you, um, Ms. Kostanić, and that is, uh, answering to what um, Mr. Soa said um, on, on behalf of Facebook, do you feel social media platforms and, for example, Facebook do enough to um, tamper this online hate speech or take it down, in your um, opinion? Can they, uh, when can they do enough? Yeah, in Bosnia, there is a lot of work to do. Uh, we, we need to more 
uh, things to be done, but uh, all the time local context has to be at the first place. So uh, we Why received, is that? as I mentioned, yeah, uh, as we as I mentioned, we received a lot of uh, different kind of complaints from media. Uh, also, we are receiving complaints from citizens on hate speech online, but uh, about uh, algorithms and filters used on um, social media platforms uh, are not adjusted to our uh, local circumstances. Uh, at the first place, maybe language and the uh, complexity of our language and our past, uh, our current position, political circumstances, because we are uh, being all the time uh, in the center of different kind of historical events. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, wars has started and happened on this uh, territory. So it's very important to put more uh, patience uh, to put more efforts to things happening on social media in Bosnia and Herzegovina to uh, establish more contact uh, with social media platforms. For example, press council so far didn't have any kind of communication. And uh, we think that is something that we should uh, have uh, in near future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I want to bring in uh, Iverna McGowan. Um, Ms. McGowan, uh, thank you for being with us. Yes, there you are. <laughs> um, we've been talking about curbing uh, online hate and how to turn around the table is what I want to get into uh, now. But one of the difficult issues again is censorship and restriction of freedom of speech. Is there a clear line that you can draw uh, to distinguish between the two? What's your opinion on that? Um. Good afternoon and thank you very much both to the European Union and to UNESCO for, for welcoming us. Um, just very briefly, the Centre for Democracy and Technology is a 25-year-old not-for-profit law and advocacy organisation. And I guess one of the unique things about us is that we bring together international, uh, international experts on human rights law and technologists, so where the two worlds meet. Um, I do think that this is you know, a, a very common question that's answered, uh, asked even. Uh, we need to start at the beginning. I was glad to see in the video, for example, that STG 16 was mentioned. And of course, uh, as many people will be aware, that that is the one that focuses on the rule of law and human rights. And I really think that we need to, uh, just as Commissioner Yourova said, say that we need to keep the same standards online and offline, and that includes the rule of law and human rights. And why I mention that is that we know as those working you know, in foreign policy or development, by now, there's a very well established nexus between equality on one hand and peace on the other. And we need to keep that intersectional lens that focus on equality as we examine our online world and how we maintain peace. And the reason I mentioned that is actually, and again, in, in the video and other uh, colleagues have referred to it, one of the solutions that has come up uh, regarding the um you know how to tackle this large scale content moderation is the introduction of automated tools um and one of the challenges as research for the center of democracy and technology has shown is that when we automate these decisions very ironically we can often end up exacerbating uh, discrimination online. So ironically, the very marginalized or at risk people that we seek to protect are the first voices to be silenced. So I think in that sense, sometimes this it, it's a false dichotomy that has been set up between, um, you know, free expression or hate speech, because actually free expression done from an international human rights law perspective is there exactly to protect against um, disproportionate, you know, discrimination or silencing of, of voices. That's one point I think is very important. Another point when it comes to disinformation and the equality element that's really important, and we haven't heard spoken about explicitly today. One thing is the questions of, you know, should is this piece of information, does it, is it legal or not, etc. International human rights law really puts a good, a strong emphasis on the need of the courts to play an important role in that. It's, it's, too complex either for social media companies. There's a lot of conflict of interest in governments deciding that information itself. But we need to remember that another driver of disinformation is actually personal data. Then perhaps the most popular example of that happened in the United States in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, whereby personal data was used, as people know, and unfortunately, again, there was a discriminatory element 
uh, where in particular black voters were fed disinformation in an effort to suppress and dissuade them from voting. So the reason I mentioned this is that often these discussions talk about individual content um, decisions, but we also need to be much more deeply aware of what are the broader systemic mechanisms. And that brings us to the question of the need for, um, in particular in developing in other countries, actually very strong data protection laws and data management laws, because that's what's driving the system and can help us um, establish a healthier online space for those of us working in it. Another maybe point that's very important in this regard in terms of social media and peace and regulation is indeed the point about elections. Um, again, the Centre for Democracy and Technology, we work both on the cyber security side of elections, so ensuring that voting machines when working, preventing against DDoS attacks, training even government officials and others in the context of election. We know when we study peace issues, it's been mentioned again before, that there can be an increase in violence or hate in the run-up to an election. When we see how many people are now getting their information about elections in online tools, you can really see how we need to modernize the manner in which we monitor elections. And one of the most steadfast and reliable ways of countering disinformation is actually to ensure a steady, credible flow of good information. And ironically, one of the things that we have discovered through our research in certain jurisdictions is that sometimes disinformation is flourishing because maybe it's the electoral commission or the local government authorities have not digitalized, do not have a social media platform, do not have a very proactive um, you know, communication campaign. So we also need to remember the role that public authorities and others have in really getting that correct information out there. So that again, it's about the entire ecosystem of information, if you like, rather than these individual decisions on content, which are also very important. A very, a very final point, again, to do with equality and peace. We know that civil society, human rights defenders, investigative journalists, they all play a key role, again, under that SDG 16 for defending democracies and peace. At the same time, unfortunately, and again, there's a lot of research to back this up, they are often the first victims of government-driven disinformation or suppression of speech. So we need to be extremely careful, especially in the European Union or other regions, as we're devising ways to regulate that online, that we do not inadvertently add to the arsenal of governments that want to suppress the speech of those very people who we will be relying on to fact check and to bring quality information into our information systems. I think there's an entire discussion there as well about how we protect our online civic space at the same time as present, preventing against hate online. Absolutely. There's a lot that uh, deserves its own uh, conference day uh, in what you're saying. Thank you so much for um, what you shared with us. Um, I want to get back to Mr. Soa for a, a reaction to what um, Ms. McGowan mentioned about equality and the deeper underlying systemic um, drivers towards disinformation or online hate speech rather than focusing on these particular individual messages that need to be taken down or not. What is your response to, to what she said about that? First of all, I just want to echo some of the points that she raised around context being very hard and how sometimes automated enforcement can miss context and enforcement and end up unintentionally silencing voices. Um, you take a context to where an individual is shedding attention to some sort of discrimination or hate speech they've experienced in their daily life that is accidentally taken down by automation because they repeat the hate speech they experienced, or a situation where a user condemns an act of hate speech or violence and incitement that's taking place elsewhere. Um, automated processes are very good at proactively identifying harmful content, but there will always be situations where we need to account for that context in which it's shared, right? And this is where our human review capacity comes in and complements our automated efforts. There's also the context through cultural and linguistic um, uh, lenses that I spoke to earlier, where we really need to continue working with experts on the ground and experts in-house who have that cultural and local context to share when we are developing policies or developing tools for automation or setting up our human review processes. Now, when it comes to the limitations that um, we have 
in terms of things that we just can't prevent. I think on our end, when it comes to elections, for instance, we are very proactive in bringing people access to the right information, ensuring that they have we have um, um, tools or information treatments that direct people to relevant information that concern elections. We did this um, in Nigeria. We've done this in South Africa and the US and elections around the world where we prompt them to election resources. But um, a point was raised fairly that sometimes that information is not accessible and we are not able to direct individuals or users to the information that they need to empower them to participate in an election in a meaningful way and exercise that civic right. So there are limitations sometimes in national frameworks where that information is not accessible. But then we have seen that there is certain journalism that takes place in many communities, even in Indonesia and in Ghana, where users come on platform and empower others with right, accurate information that they need to understand what's going on in elections, what's going on in their communities and how they can engage with these issues. It's also empowered candidates who are participating in elections with a platform to directly access the electorate and engage with them on the policies that are important to them and might be of importance to the electorate as well. And also even the playing field for political parties or candidates in elections who might be smaller than the larger ones so that they can also get the information out there. So in a sense, social media platforms like ours do provide opportunities um, that states often don't in giving them the information that they need. But then it's also like a, a tricky situation or a slim line between that reputable information and the disinformation that can also disempower them. And in those situations, we have election policies that remove content um, that misrepresents details of the election or the voting process that might then unintentionally disenfranchise voters. Okay, thank you for, for that. I want to bring in Mr. Bosch and Muller. Um, I haven't forgotten you. Um, you're still there. Yes, I see you. Broad smile, thank you. Um, we've been talking about social media for peace as, as a way of dealing with negative aspects of social media. Um, but talk about the for peace element in this project. Um, how, how can it be implemented? Should it be implemented as a um, policy tool really? Is that desirable or should it just be left to the civic community? Well, thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you for having me today on, on uh, the World Peace Day. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think that, that even the panel here and the discussions that were also in the previous panel show that the approach behind uh, this project um, together with, with UNESCO is very a, a broad one. It's not, um, it, it's not an approach of pointing fingers at anybody uh, to saying uh, you are to blame for, for, for this behavior. It's a realization that this is, this is a reality of, of everyday life. Everybody is now dealing with, uh, uh, with a social media reality in every aspect of our lives. Um, and in order to, to, to deal with the challenges that come with this new reality, it's, not, it's, it's of course important to find ways of, of countering what is bad, but it's equally important to nourish the things uh, that, that can work uh, in a positive direction in terms of peace. Um, I, I think that, that um, if, I, if I take an example from, from how uh, my children were introduced to social media and being on the internet. I think there are sometimes good lessons in the most basic elements, but they were taught that when you are in, uh, in a cyberspace, you are basically in a space. So imagine yourself being in a public square. How would you behave there? Um, this is a new square for all of us in a sense. We ha have to establish a regular regulatory framework as we have in, in physical public spaces. And we need to have responsible actors, both in terms of media actors and in terms of media users. So I think what we are trying to do through this initiative of bringing people together from, from all aspects of this, of this square. So um, providers of, of, of uh, social media uh, platforms, regulators, uh, expertise uh, in the area, uh, whether it's on media, whether it's on, on, on basic rights or any other aspect, uh, peace building, uh, as well as 
users uh, represented by, by uh, civil society organizations. By bringing everybody around the table and discussing, as it was mentioned very well by, by Gerald, how, how can we operate in very diverse context where there's a need to have general rules, but also adapted approaches. I think what we are, what we are doing through this project is, is something going in the right direction. The possibility of having three countries where you can test an approach, where you can prove that uh, an active engagement with the national authorities is actually something that's possible. In, in most cases, it's something that there's, there's also a desire to have from, from national authorities who often do not necessarily have to, to, the tools to, to, to deal with this. Um, it is, um, it's an example also, it can be used as an example of the need to have uh, local approaches to a, to a global challenge. So I think that what, what we hope to see at the end of this project is um, three contexts where the project has been able to make a difference, where it has started a debate, uh, and where uh, authorities have welcomed uh, the input, and that also that the platforms learn from, from the experiences, and that other countries will then be able to look at that as an example to follow. So not to, to copy, not to cut and paste, but an approach that can be adapted uh, to each reality in which it has to operate. Okay. We, we have to realize that, that social media is a reality that will be here with us. We have already adapted our approach to how we deal with social media in our work in terms of peace building and crisis response. Throughout history, actors in conflict have always been very good and very fast at adapting to new technology. It's time for us as peace builders to do the same. And I think with this project, we are going one step in the right direction. And I'm really happy to be here with, you know, uh, a panel that represents so many of the key actors in this process. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I have one more question in the back of my mind for you, but I'll come back to you uh, for that later. Um, I want to go to Anita Wahid, um, because there's mention of working together with public authorities and the fact that that's not always um, self-evident. What's your experience in Indonesia based on social media for peace, uh, the social media for peace project? How did that work out? Does it work out or not? Well, uh, I I don't think I can testify whether it works or uh, it works out or not. But I think uh, some of the things that uh, I really hope that will be implemented by projects like social media for peace right now is that uh, some of the things that have been implemented by different uh, actors or stakeholders on this uh, problem, on these issues of disinformation and hate speech has been relying heavily on the rationale of human beings. But many studies have expressed that human beings are by their very nature irrational, not, ra not rational. Disinformation and hate speech, for instance, are, uh, they are very perfect and effective to be used as a weapon to, uh, to incite certain things because they fear of emotion. And in Indonesia, the weaponization of disinformation and hate speech is being done by creating messages that let people to believe that there are imminent threat to their uh, identity, to their well-being, to incite certain emotions to come up, uh, such as distrust, suspicion, worry, anger, hate, hatred, such, uh, and such uh, other emotions. And these messages, as we know, also known as hate, hate spin, created this illusion that other groups are out to get us and we are oppressed even when we are a majority and that the purity of our teachings is in danger because of the existence of other groups and such other uh, key messages of this kind of messages uh, so what i really like to have uh, see in projects like social media for peace is how we can actually address this emotional issue how we can actually try to reduce the perception of threat, how we can actually uh, um, answer uh, to, to the fear that these people have about being threatened by other groups, how we can, uh, you know, in this case, uh, I think I, I, I will also 
um, echo the uh, my colleague here that says that the, that the steady flow of credible information is very needed, much needed, especially in terms of bringing out that other groups are not a threat that other groups are just merely trying to coexist peacefully with us. Uh, and, and therefore, there is no need for us to have a perception of threats or something. And this will uh, hopefully will get people to see the diversity is a blessing, not a threat. And what I also like to see in, in, in the, the projects like social media for peace is more uh, uh, educational material, materials to do simple fact checking, recognizing this information, recognizing which is hate speech and which is not, recognizing um, malicious and harmful contents. And especially one very, uh, very important uh, aspect of, of education for, through uh, a project like Social Media for Peace is to actually get users to have a more uh, deeper emotional intelligence. Because as we know that the uh, disinformation and hate speech are particularly targeting emotions. So if users can actually uh, have the capacity to identify the kind of emotions that they have when they receive information and to actually be able to control uh, those emotions, that will be uh, very helpful in terms of reducing the potential of inflicting conflicts. Thank you very much for that. So I, I, um, I take away that um, education empowerment, media literacy, but also sort of emotional intelligence is needed in order to deal with um, social media platforms, the digital sphere at large. But what you um, really pointed out is rather a polit political and philosophical matter even, that is how to um, counter the feeling that's driving successful hate messages, the excitement apparently, the fact of being recognized in a certain feeling of being um, not seen or not seen enough or not recognized in your um, difficulty or, or um, personal situation. Mr. Gijsen, do you have an answer? Is it possible to really create a, let me call it a peace narrative that is as emotionally engaging and exciting as uh, a lot of the online hate speech? Because that is at the heart, I think, of, of what um, Ms. White just said. Yeah, I, I think uh, we recognize that social media is relatively new. And I like the, the previous speaker com comparison with this being a new kind of market uh, place uh, where we have to find out how to deal with these issues that now come up in that marketplace, uh, misinformation, disinformation, hate speech. And I think we're, we're in that process. We're still trying to find our way. Uh, we need to be innovative. Um, the, the previous panel and also some of the previous speakers in this panel uh, emphasized the role of uh, regulations, and that's one way. Maybe it's intuitively that we go to that first. Uh, but there are, of course, and it was discussed, uh, limitations. There are risks. Uh, it is also always perceived as top down. So I, I question a bit the effectiveness of that. So we need an innovative approach. And that is what this uh, this new project wishes uh, to do. Uh, the new approach is to really engage, uh, focus uh, on the users, on the participants, and, and imagine uh, uh, what a force you can mobilize with that. Uh, just to give you uh, some data from here in Kenya. Um, uh, internet access is around 50%, uh, but, but mobile penetration is already at 90%. Um, and in that sense, Kenya is, is one of the most ICT progressive nations here in the region. And of course, in the coming four to five years, we will see these figures progress rapidly. Um, now, uh, I also would like to, to remind of the International Day of Peace and the theme for this year, uh, which is recovering better for an equitable and sustainable world. Um, and, and that really resonates well with the Social Media for Peace uh, project. And uh, let me also um, uh, uh, maybe share with you the uh, one sentence from the message of the UN Secretary General on this day, where he says, and I quote, uh, to celebrate peace, by standing up against acts of hate online and offline, 
and by spreading compassion, kindness and hope in the face of the pandemic and as we recover. And I think this says it all. It is putting the focus on uh, what I would call uh, not just the user, but the participant in uh, social media. So the innovation comes really in two ways. First, by emphasizing that there is a key role for the consumer uh, and the social media participant, uh, empower participants in, in social media, uh, so, so awareness, capacity building, skills development. I, I like this, uh, uh, this point on emotional empathy as well, so self-reflection. Um, so be critical in, in the way they search for, the way they consume information and share information. Um, check the credibility of sources, uh, check supporting sources, uh, check for evidence-based information. And that all uh, translates into um, uh, an attitude, an awareness, and a capacity and skills. Mm -hmm. um, so the second one is really by turning the game around. If, if social media is used so efficiently, uh, as a way to, to, to ventilate hate speech, myths and disinformation, uh, then it can be equally well and, and maybe even better used to do the opposite. So, so let's also look at it as a force, um, uh, not only for fact-checking and, and discarding myths and disinformation, uh, but also as a source for positive messaging positive imaging uh, to its peaceful uh, societies. Uh, let me stop here and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. McGowan, um, in, in all the research you at your institute do, uh, you and your colleagues, is there a, 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 not a silver bullet, that's too negative an image, but is there a holy grail of the peace or democracy narrative somewhere uh, hidden? Uh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things that all of us working in content moderation know that it's uh, it's a very complex area, as we've seen even from the two panels today. But I do agree that we need to look at a broad toolbox. And um, I do think an element necessarily will need to be regulation because there's just parts of it, as I mentioned, in, in particular, data protection and the driving systems. Um, you know, transparency about how algorithms are, are working. There's an element of that. But we also know, I mean, there's a lot of neuroscience actually to pick up on this point about people are motivated by that deep level thinking in their brain. On one hand, it goes to the very negative, but on the positive side, you know, we've seen that even in the, the science of election campaigns and others, that it is in our nature to respond to positive messaging as well. So I do think, again, going to a previous point that we make sure that the positive narratives, the correct information is there in abundance and done in a very thoughtful way is really important. And maybe one other point, I think that too often in these debates, we fall into black and white solutions. For example, that content has to be taken down or content is left up. There's a range of different varieties that we can do, whether it's you know, limiting the um, amplification of certain content, whether it's labeling information, whether it's promoting other sources of information. Um, and, you know, so we also need, to, it, our world is nuanced and complex and our response to the online world needs that nuance and complexity as well. And I got, obviously at the Center for Democracy and Technology, we do constantly advocate to, let's not create a different set of norms for our online world. The international human rights law framework is really useful and can be applied. Sometimes we need to think a little bit more through about how exactly it applies um, in different contexts, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater either and remember that indeed we have these frameworks that can be really usefully applied to keep vibrant civic space, uh, democracy and discourse alive and well in our online spaces. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, slowly rounding off this discussion, but uh, Ms. Kastendic, uh, I want to come to you because Mr. Gezin and others have uh, mentioned the need for engagement, uh, civic engagement and, and the responsibility of users of these platforms as well um, in, in this whole discussion, actually. Um, you feel that there's a role for local social media um, councils, so to speak, to give feedback to Facebook. Could you just briefly explain how you would see that work and what its role would be? 
Uh, yeah, but uh, before explaining that um, connection between social media councils and press councils and all, all other stakeholders, local stakeholders, I just wanted to uh, say that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, with support of UNESCO and EU in last year, um, uh, precisely because of the need of putting more uh, light on that special um, relation between journalists uh, and social media, uh, we have conducted a big survey among uh, 60 media, uh, editors-in-chief, journalists and bloggers on how do they feel uh, using social media, uh, do they have any kind of problems, um, do they receive threats, uh, did they express uh, or um, had been victims of the hate speech, so what are their experiences? So. Uh, results uh, were uh, really interesting uh, and <laughs> quite eye-opening for us. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, this kind of connection with social media councils is uh, really necessary. Uh, because, um, for example, when it comes to hate speech, uh, almost all uh, people who were included in our survey, uh, they had uh, received uh, threats, they had received uh, hate speech, some of them uh, reported hate speech to the uh, platform, but uh, nothing happened, unfortunately. And uh, because of that experience, a lot of them, uh, they were discouraged to report more. Uh, and also when it comes to uh, content, uh, many of them complained that uh, their content uh, had been uh, deranked, so uh, they didn't get enough reach because uh, not understanding a real content of that journalistic uh, article uh, led to uh, that article being uh, moved uh, further and uh, and they complained that there were no communication between platform and journalists so that was one of the uh, really interesting um, things from our survey. Uh, also, uh, when it comes to uh, Bosnian and Herzegovina um, experience, journalist experience, latest example that we have uh, known is uh, when it comes to uh, journalistic reports on the past events, uh, for example, uh, on our uh, of people uh, who were uh, sentenced uh, by International uh, Criminal Tribune uh, for war crimes. Uh, thing happened that uh, on social media platform, uh, articles who were containing uh, word Ratko Mladic, that is a person who were convicted, so it was um, convicted by a criminal tribune. Uh, all those articles, no matter uh, of content of those articles, they were removed from the uh, network. So they were flagged as a way of promotion of criminal organization. But uh, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning, it was uh, a part of our uh, society to report on things that include, that needs to be referred to past because it's our everyday situation. So uh, those articles were flagged and uh, they were removed from the uh, social media platform. So those are things that maybe uh, should be uh, also considered and maybe social media council uh, there could uh, help. And uh, also press council receives a lot of complaints of people uh, on content of hate speech in comments, uh, because here when uh, things got rough on online media portals, a lot of editors, because they were not capable, uh, they didn't have enough moderators to moderate all the uh, user-generated contents, they uh, just uh, decided to uh, close down uh, user-generated contents, so they just uh, closed comment sections. Uh, but uh, at the same time, all those articles, they were posted on their social uh, media platforms, and hate speech then uh, happened. It, it was not only at the same amount, but it was uh, even bigger, and uh, media uh, got in problem with uh, dealing with that kind of uh, drastic uh, breach of the freedom of expression. So, uh, in that those cases, uh, there would be uh, very useful not only for the press council but for our uh, media community to have uh, 
one body uh, as a social media council who would uh, be a uh, support of the press council and uh, vice versa uh, who can uh, communicate with the press council in case uh, we are receiving uh, complaints on social media platforms and to better promote and protect freedom of expression and freedom of reporting and position of media uh, which has Thank been you. endangered uh, in past times. Thank you very much. Um, that calls for a, a last reaction of Mr. Soa, uh, because Mr. Soa, I um, take away two ideas. Um, first and foremost, uh, transparency regarding why things are being taken down or demoted in a, a timeline or in what you get to see is one question. How far are you willing to go in offering that transparency? It's been mentioned before during the high level panel as well as one of the key factors in creating trust between users and the, the platforms. Um, and also on the other hand, um, there's an oversight board, Facebook oversight board, um, we have one of the members on one of the later panels. Um, but maybe, I mean, it's just too much work. You preempted criticism in that sense already. Like, I mean, there are billions and billions of messages. We cannot um, prevent uh, any, any wrong kind of message to slip through the net, so to speak. Um, but might social media councils uh, locally based help you achieving that goal? So two questions there. Thanks so much. On the transparency front, this is something that I think a lot of incoming regulation in the EU has picked up on and mirrors our own values when it comes to the way in which we decide to either develop policies or enforce on the content that comes on our platform. So when you go on our website, we have a transparency hub. We're one of the very first tech companies or social media firms that was very public about our policies and what they cover and don't cover. We cover the entire spectrum of all the policy areas or abuse areas that are reflected in content online. So from hate speech to misinformation to violence and incitement, details on how we approach enforcement for each of these issues are clearly outlined in the Transparency Hub. We're also committed to publishing a quarterly committee standards enforcement report, which not only breaks down the amount of content we take down um, through human review, but also the amount of content that's identified proactively by automated systems. And then you also get to track comparatively as to previous reports and how we perform in from quarter to quarter. We also have a report that publishes the widely viewed content. This is an understanding that sometimes virality is linked to harmful content. So users have the chance of seeing what is mostly engaged with, either as pieces of posts, as pages, as groups, or off-platform links that are shared on our platform. And what these reports have done is that they've also highlighted the fact that the majority of engagement on our platform is really um, benign and kind and shows the better aspects or the more innocent parts of human nature. But um, as was pointed earlier, our natural instinct is to focus on the harmful and rightfully so when we operate at a scale that which we operate, um, the, the smaller aspects of that harmful content can have wide reaching consequences offline. And this is something that we're mindful of. So we also, in addition to all the other reports that I spoke to, speak to how we develop our policies and how we engage with stakeholders around the world to get that local context into account when we're shaping the policies and enforcing on them. I think my colleague from Bosnia has highlighted quite well how important that context is in ensuring that we're not inadvertently or unintentionally removing content that is meant to empower others with useful information or with useful context. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the oversight board, we believe that as a firm that we should be constantly engaging or constantly getting feedback on how we're doing when it comes to content moderation, we realize that we don't have all the answers, that we will make mistakes. And the oversight board is just one level of accountability that we have in place. It's an independent oversight board that users can access in appealing content decisions that we've made. Users can flag these decisions to the oversight board for their review, and then they then review it and then give guidance on whether they feel that we've made the right action or that we haven't, as well as guidance on what they think we could do better 
all this feedback that we get from the oversight board globally, as well as their local engagement that we do with civil society organizations, with academics, with journalists, or through platforms like this, are incredibly useful in guiding us and empowering us with the information that we need to serve our users better. Um, and like I pointed out in the beginning, this is a journey that we're embarking on. Um, I'm really excited about projects and initiatives like this where collaboration is at its core, where we get to learn from each other and empower each other with the information that we need to do better and to determine areas of investments that will serve um, the global public much Indeed. better. Indeed. Exchange ideas uh, constructively uh, critical or critically constructive. Uh, you can uh, pick and choose. We've come to the end of this uh, session. Um, it's lunchtime. Um, I want to thank all of you, dear guests, dear panelists, to take part in this um, conversation. Professor Hubert Gijze, Simon Boysen Muller, Iverna McGowan, Gerald Soa, Anita Wahid and Maida Bata Kastendic. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your ideas and your hopes for the future also um, regarding social media for peace. It was very enlightening and um, as has been said a couple of times before uh, during this morning session, um, all the partners here around the table have got their work cut out for them uh, in this whole process of getting to know how to navigate this new, relatively new by now, um, digital sphere, an agora or an arena, pick and choose, it uh, morphs from the one into the other and back again um, regularly. So it's an ongoing process. As I said, this is where we break for lunch. We will be back at half past one sharp with two more sessions, one about the coronavirus facts project and one about the importance of context, contextualization of online harmful content in order to curb it more effectively. It's been touched upon already in the previous sessions. I hope uh, the sessions so far has provided, have provided food for thought and um, I wish you a nice lunch now, a uh, short walk maybe, shake those legs, free the mind and hope to see you again in a little under an hour or exactly in an hour. See you then. Bye bye.